Hello, I am Teresa Stack, an associate professor at Montana Tech, and this learning unit covers sampling strategies and exposure assessment. There is a lot of materials here, so it'll be broken down into two parts. So our goals will be for you to understand a basic sampling strategy or a framework for setting up a sampling strategy. Really, we're going to spend most of our time considering the protocols for each hazard, um, whether that's in a similar exposure group or not, and then evaluating the exposure. Um, the material that is referenced would be our text. Chapters 1, 2, and 23 are great chapters. You can probably get more from reading that material than you can from um, listening to this recorded lecture. It's covered in immense detail here. It's actually an entire course um, offered at Montana Tech, one that I think is really worthy um, of your um, elective credits. I also use as a reference this somewhat older, a little bit older document, the NIOSH um, Occupational Exposure and Sampling Strategy Manual. There's really some good foundational material in there that other documents such as this have been built on. And then um, the Department of Defense Industrial Hygiene ESAM system or DOOR system where I um, incorporate their protocol and different elements that you uh, may be somewhat unfamiliar with or somewhat familiar with. And much of this reference material is posted there on Moodle for you to take a look at. So before we start talking about our sampling strategy, I just want to make um, I just want to clarify the difference between screening and monitoring and sampling. And sometimes these are all part of our exposure assessment plans, what we're going to um, do in the workplace. Really, um, an, a sampling strategy or an exposure assessment model, those are two different things, and they can be very um, broad or very focused. And so um, we do screening, monitoring, and sampling as part of our industrial hygiene work. But we develop specific strategies for um, work areas or certain processes. And after we develop our strategy, then we have a protocol for each specific agent. So one way I like to think about this or explain it is that a strategy would be developed for your entire facility, or and then a sub-strategy for each process or hazard inside of that facility. And then for um, each subset or each process, you would develop a protocol for each agent that you're going to sample, sometimes even a protocol for each hazard that you're going to assess. And it wouldn't necessarily just mean protocol, it could be protocols depending on how many different hazards um, were in the workplace. So that's why I think that you know one two-week lecture certainly doesn't cover the scope of this. But it will give you a basic understanding of the methodology that's used to set up your sampling strategy as well as your exposure assessment plan. So what is screening? You may remember from epidemiology that screening is used to identify individuals or working populations with the propensity to develop a disease. Screening is used in a preclinical phase. So a really good example of this is when we take blood pressure that um, if it's elevated, that is used as a screening tool for later diagnostics that can be used to evaluate whether somebody has um, may develop a heart disease, right? So our high blood pressure reading or a blood pressure reading is actually being used as a screening tool. So screening detects disease or body functions before an individual would normally see care. That's that preclinical phase. Screening tests are usually administered to individuals without current symptoms, but who may be at high risk for certain health outcomes. So that's screening, and now let's look at what is monitoring. So monitoring is where we identify individuals that exhibit early signs of occupational disease or the propensity to develop those diseases based on their risk factors. 
So an easy example for this is we put um, workers in our hearing conservation program, which is a monitoring program, if they are exposed to noise above 85 decibels, assuming you are following the OSHA standard. So this is a monitoring program. They either have early signs of an occupational disease or disorder or their exposure to risk factors qualifies them to be in a certain category and then they're part of your surveillance or monitoring program. And monitoring or surveillance has a preventative focus as does screening, it has a preventative focus. So when I describe this um, autometric testing or hearing conservation program, we also call this medical monitoring. And it's the analysis of health information to look for problems that may be occurring in a workplace and to try to target our interventions. And so surveillance serves as a feedback loop to the employer to see whether people are, um, whether it is a sentinel event, um, events that are occurring over a period of time or just one case. And that way we're able to look for trends in our monitoring. So for example, in our hearing conservation program, if all of our workers are in our hearing conservation program, we have 50 of them, and over the last 10 years, none of them have had a uh, threshold level shift, we can um, conclude with a certain amount of confidence that our controls are effective in keeping their dose down, as well as our monitoring program is putting um, checks in place, checks and balances in place to ensure that people's exposure are below or within a certain level and that our controls are actually working. So surveillance um, is used as our feedback loop. So when we talk about monitoring, there's also biological monitoring. Some of you may do biological monitoring. Um, it's usually more evasive or expensive than conducting sampling, and sampling is, of course, a type of monitoring. Um, but with biological monitoring, it certainly is a closer look at the true dose or the um, what I like to call the residual dose, so it's left in the body after um, elimination. Sometimes you measure the bottom, the body burden levels directly, and other times it's a metabolite or a, a body or a biomarker of the exposure or a biomarker of the effect. So another form of worker monitoring is sampling, where we sample the exposure that the worker receives. So exposure monitoring measures or estimates a personal exposure by measuring the concentrations of a substance in the work environment. And so just as a reminder, um, what we measure in the work environment is a surrogate for dose. We truly don't know what the dose is that a worker is receiving unless you're doing biological monitoring or of course noise sampling where you're um, wearing a dosimeter. So for example in the picture um, you can do some air sampling and measure the amount of exposure around the worker's breathing zone but the way this worker works or breathes or um, eliminates or biotransforms bio the material will have a bearing on what the true dose is. So we're going to move from the generalities of um, screening and um, monitoring into sampling. So our sampling strategy and our exposure model, the eight steps that you see here are from the Department of Defense's Industrial Hygiene Manual. Although it is exactly the same uh, methodology that's used in the AIHA text, it's just that the DOD breaks out the intermediate steps where the intermediate steps are um, hidden within the AIHA model, and it looks at just these major steps. So this tends to have a little bit more um, detail in at least its layout, which can help you kind of grasp these concepts if you're somewhat unfamiliar with the, the way you develop and modify a sampling strategy based on somebody's um, exposure. So at the beginning are these first two steps, this basic characterization and um, defining your objectives. 
and you really really you don't do the steps in order one and two you kind of do them at the same time a lot of times you have to characterize the workplace before you can define your objectives so you have to have a basic idea of what's there we do this through our anticipation and our recognition before we move forward into our evaluation so these two steps are done together um, and through our basic characterization or at the same time sometimes we can start to develop similar exposure groups before we develop our sampling strategy other times we have to sample for a while before we can confidently put people into similar exposure groups after we develop our objectives and our similar exposure groups then we can develop our um, workplace monitoring plan and that's where we'll have specific protocol for certain campaigns and certain agents and that's the core of this class and so I'll spend more time there than on some of these other steps so after our results come back of course we characterize our exposures um, and then we assess our exposures and provide a control plan based on our assessment um, at the end there's always reporting and record keeping um, what we need to report out and then reevaluation to see if we will over a period of time change our sampling strategy so it is in a sense a moving uh, target our sampling strategy but we need to have a sound foundation of what we're going to do when we reach these decision points and we do this in developing our sampling strategy beforehand based on our objectives so we start with this basic characterization and our monitoring plan and developing similar exposure groups. Sometimes we have to actually um, sample to develop our similar exposure groups. Other times that has been done for us or through our observational studies, we can feel fairly confident that people have similar exposures. And that is a topic all in of itself and will be discussed later on in class. And then you have your exposure assessment whether you have acceptable, uncertain, or uh, unknown exposures. We put our, we recommend our controls that are in our, that need to be put into place. And this could um, be where we would change our um, um, sampling strategy or start to make a decision as to how frequently we may need to sample based on our results, right? So an exposure that's closer to a PEL would require more frequent sampling than an exposure that is within 1% of a permissible exposure limit. And it's always a closed loop. You have this um, re-evaluation. So the steps, we start by defining our objective. We do this through our basic characterization of identifying the hazards, our high-risk workers and controls that are in place, or high-risk processes. When at all possible, we establish our similar exposure groups because this helps us in our industrial hygiene evaluation because we certainly can't evaluate um, all our workers unless we have a really small um, demographic or a really small population. And then we develop our workplace monitoring plan that is our master schedule and we'll have a sub um, set of that as a protocol for each and every one of our agents. And our monitoring plan, this is where um, I suppose more specifically, I should say that this is where this is going to change, where our exposure strategy or our sampling strategy can say somewhat the same, but our monitoring plan may change after we establish our similar exposure groups and do some basic characterization, or we truly characterize the exposures, then our monitoring plan may change somewhat over time. And hopefully the example will help clarify some of these steps. So if you go to Moodle and you click on the link here, example used for exposure model, this is um, an assessment that was done for workers who were um, maintaining and repairing um, landing gear that was cadmium plated. So this is the exposure assessment. I used this exposure assessment to um, develop this PowerPoint so you can see how the sampling strategy led to the detailed monitoring plan which then later led to the sampling or the exposure assessment um, the characterization of that exposure and the controls that were put into place so I think sometimes these terms can be misused and I must apologize sometimes I cross them 
Your sampling strategy is your overall framework and it has decision trees in there to how you're going to um, conduct exposure assessments within your workplace, within your entire workplace. And there will be detailed monitoring plans for um, each work area or each agent. Usually you have a sampling protocol based on the methods and how you're going to sample for each agent or each sampling campaign. So think of your strategy as how you're going to evaluate the entire workplace. And your strategy has a decision point as to when you're going to modify your monitoring plan. So for example, if I have um, workers within a new process who are exposed within 10% of the permissible exposure limit, I may go back and uh, monitor every month until their exposure is down below the action limit. Um, if, if you have another example, so I have workers who are exposed at 1% of the permissible exposure limit, then I may modify my monitoring plan and only go back and reevaluate once a year. So your strategy is your overall framework for the entire work area. And in there, there are subparts. So there will be sub-strategies for each different hazard or each different work zone. And then there's protocols for each different agent. So really, the text does a great job of um, explaining all these different um, elements and gives you time to kind of pour over them and integrate them to what you um, already know. So this is the um, exposure model or the sampling strategy from our text. And you can see that it has far less elements than the DOD model, but they're just, they're just built in, in somewhat in a different way. So we're going to start with our basic characterization and um, developing our objectives. One way that we can start with our basic um, characterization is through the anticipation of the hazards that we find in the workplace, whether that's from manufacturers' recommendations, employee requirements, um, regulations that have been put into place about um, frequency of sampling or new regulations, lower permissible exposure limits, or an evaluation of our safety data sheet. And then we recognize the um, hazards from our anticipation phase and um, we just make put them in our major categories, our physical hazards, our environmental hazards, and um, I consider ergonomic hazards physical hazards. I wouldn't necessarily use that word, but that's because I'm an ergonomist. Um, ergonomics is the solution, not the problem. And then the next step would be in our evaluation. This is where we're setting up our monitoring plan. Who are we going to sample for? How are we going to sample? Um, what controls have already been put into place? And after we get our results, then we can... Um, make sure that our controls are appropriate for injury and illness reduction. So basic characterization and de developing our objectives. When, when we take a look at what kind of substances are in the workplace, we really have to think about the way in which they are likely to harm a worker. Um, are they acute effects, chronic effects, or some kind of um, combination of both, which Usually they are some kind of combination of both. So our acute effects are substances that act quickly to elicit their toxic response. And is it important to control the dose across a single shift? So for example, your eight hour time weighted average, or maybe even a shorter period of time, such as 15 minute STLs or ceilings. So these are for things which are um, acute effects, they're fast acting, and maybe their effects are irreversible, such as hydrogen cyanide. Long-term exposures may be um, less relevant if there is no accumulation in the body or if recovery um, occurs from one shift to the next. So for example, carbon monoxide, um, you can have an acute effect, but you can recover. Then we're not so concerned with the long-term effects. But for chronic disease agents, it's important to limit the cumulative dose re acquired by the workers. 
and to establish the acceptable exposure parameter over a long time, and therefore we need to sample over a longer period of time. And so that's when we'd be looking at our um, eight-hour time-weighted averages that can be used to limit the cumulative dose and um, reduce the effects of chronic diseases. Although usually what we see is an effect of both acute and chronic diseases. So um, if we're unsure or if we want to be very thorough, we can um, include in our eight-hour sampling STELs and ceilings, and that ensures that we take into account um, short-term toxicity and chronic or long-term um, toxicity. So this is just a short video of what a sandblasting operation um, looks like. It isn't a video of the one that's being evaluated um, in the... It isn't, uh, it isn't the one that's evaluated in the report, but it's one that... Um, an evaluation that we did in uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina. And these folks aren't actually sandblasting in this situation. They are cleaning up the debris that is accumulated on the ground. But you can at least see the clothing that they're in, the heavy um, nozzles that they have to use, which is full with um, high pressure, the heavy um, airlines, both breathing air as well as um, compressed air. And if you're wondering why they cleaned it up this way, it's because um, the architects ignored the workers who requested a grating underneath the, uh, on the floor of the aircraft hangar so that the media would fall below and um, be more easily recovered. So an example of um, at least the PPE and sandblasting. So as we begin to develop our sampling strategy, we identify our major processes. For this example, there are three major processes, metal preparation, metal fabrication, and metal finishing. So this is a large-scale aircraft maintenance, repair, and overhaul facility working primarily with landing gear components, and it goes through three major processes. So within each of these processes, you have sub-processes, right, or subtasks. We have abrasive blasting, um, acid alkaline cleaning and degreasing under metal preparation. Under metal fabrication is machining, and under metal finishing is thermal spray, electroplating, and painting. So as part of our exposure strategy, we identified the work areas and the subtasks. And then through our basic characterization, we develop a monitoring plan for maybe each one of these subtasks. And it could be significantly different um, because the risks may be different in different areas. So again, your strategy is overarching and your monitoring plan starts to break it down and get slightly more um, specific. And this is an example of, um, it would have been step uh, one, but it's the acid alkaline cleaning and degreasing process. This isn't a picture from the report, it's a picture from Naval Air Station Whidbey Island, but we were looking at um, a very similar process here. So we, were, we did have to um, sample in this area as well as sampling that was done with the abrasive blasting. So our basic characterization and um, sometimes putting people into exposure, similar exposure groups means we truly need to understand the hazards and the process. So components are electroplated with cadmium during the metal finishing. Um, and then when you need to rework a piece, so it's come in for preventative maintenance, that paint is removed and the removal of that paint is done with high velocity um, particles, whether they're um, abrasive glass or plastic media that gets thrown against the metal and it chips off 
and to simplify it, it chips off the paint. And in doing so, it creates airborne emissions of not only the media that's being used to remove the paint, but the paint chips itself. Cadmium um, is one of the agents for which they needed to sample for in this area. There could have been other ones, and so there would have been a protocol for each other agent that was within that work area. But cadmium is a highly toxic um, metal and exposure to it is known to cause uh, cancer and target the body's cardiovascular, renal, gastrointestinal, neurological, and reproductive system. Requirements to protect workers are found under different areas of the OSHA standard, either general industry, shipyards, or um, construction. And so um, the way the paint is blasted from the metal is either with those hand-operated nozzles, such as the example that I showed you, or um, blasting that's done inside of um, booths, and they use glove boxes. So here is um, an example of a, oops, here's an example of a blasting booth where the worker can enter in and close the door and work on larger parts or for smaller parts the worker would not need to suit up they can um, work with their hands through the glove box and not actually enter the enclosure or the um, enclosure yes and then you can see the different areas are also labeled in this picture so there's two ways in which people are exposed to cadmium either um, working through the glove box course if there's any debris that leaves the enclosed in um, workroom or by entering the workroom itself. And here's um, another example of working in a um, working in a enclosure but the worker is on the outside and they put their hands through these gloves and they're able to manipulate the object and do the abrasive blasting without actually entering the booth. You can see the containment system that's over here where it's capturing um, the cadmium or and the media that's being used and here's where it's being captured. Um, as a side note, I can't help but say this, but from an ergonomic perspective, these are notoriously difficult for people to um, work in, as in like sticking their hands in the glove box over long periods of time because of the um, awkward posture, uh, the difficulty assuming um, a s comfortable seated posture because of all the stuff that's kind of in the, in the way, and the position of the um, looking glass or when you look through the glove box through that window, the angle of it and the orientation of it as well as all the media that builds up on the other side, like the inside, makes these very difficult to work with. But an industrial hygienist, as opposed to an ergonomist, may love the um, glove box because the exposure is limited. An ergonomist may choose to uh, recommend that a worker gets away from the glove box because of the awkward postures and is in more comfortable body postures when working inside of an enclosed booth. So different ways that you can uh, define your scope. And this is another example of a similar process, but they're instead of doing media blasting, they're using hand grinders, but very similar. This was, um, I think the paint here was chromium as opposed to having cadmium in it. So cadmium becomes airborne during the blastic operation as well as you have spent contaminants. So this is where the basic characterization takes a look at um, who's there, how is the work being performed, how many workers do you have, so we, we need to know to choose how many people we're going to sample, um, what kind of PPE is being used, and what the primary objective is of your further monitoring. So we need to know something about the hazards before we can develop our objective and our um, monitoring plan. So the organization was the blasting division. They met and coordinated with the blasting division supervisor. We had 14 full-time workers over two shifts. That's primary task was 
uh, media blasting. They found PPE, media capturing system. Although in observation, dust was present on the outside of the blasting booth, and um, this individual was lucky enough to have some prior industrial hygiene sampling that they'd be able to use. So the objectives ensure engineering controls are sufficient to limit exposures to the lowest possible dose and also to monitor for secondary contamination. So primary contamination would be, um, is the media contained within the sampling booth and are the workers wearing um, appropriate personal protective gear to protect them? Secondary contamination would be if the um, capture system is leaking and the spent cadmium degree, debris or sand is being carried someplace throughout the shop or in um, being drawn into parts of the shop that aren't protected through a ventilation system. So primary, secondary contamination. So through the basic characterization, they um, evaluated the monitoring data for potential overexposures. And they saw that um, the time-weighted averages exceeded the OSHA action limit and PEL. So this was from primary or um, primary evaluations where workers were actually being sampled. They did wipe samples that indicated that cadmium was on the outside of the shop and that there was um, definitely an inefficiency between the engineering and the administrative controls. So samples were previously collected in 2007 by a certified industrial hygienist. The samples were analyzed by a accredited lab and all the supervisors and abrasive blasting workers were informed of the results. So this is part of the basic characterization because this is what was done before the new monitoring plan was put into place. So we have an idea that um, people have been informed. If we take a look at the samples, we can see whether they have been um, collected in a way to minimize errors. And um, it looks like samples were collected in 2007, which might be um, quite a long time ago if the results were being analyzed in 2015 or 2017. Also part of our basic characterization is to review what kind of workplace controls were in place. Here it was a downdraft system, as well as reviewing the work practices. And this is definitely part of the exposure assessment. It's a comprehensive task. I think sometimes this is mix, missed and we get focused on our air sampling and we forget wipe sampling, um, personal protective equipment programs that are in place, what respiratory protection programs as well as decontamination, potential issues with laundering of uniforms, housekeeping, um, hazardous waste management, preventative maintenance, as well as training. So this is also part of an exposure assessment plan. Um, I'm sorry, of an exposure assessment strategy is to look at all the work practices as well as the hazards. And there is a report that's posted on the web from um, the Department of the Navy where you can see how each and every one of these areas was reviewed um, using a different setup than we're looking at here today. So here's an example of the understanding the process as well as the engineering and personal protective equipment as well as administrative controls that may be put into place. So the workers were wearing an outer disposable coverall, an inner disposable nitrate glove, outer rubber booties, an outer layer of um, leather gloves. They had an inner laundered coverall and type C blast helmet with a respirator and a cape um, or a hood. Well, it's a hood with a chest protection, so a hood with a cape would be appropriate. So this is the personal protective equipment that was put into place. Is this appropriate given the recognition of the hazards that we're finding out there? Is this, is, is this what's being recommended to protect people against cadmium? That's the question. So this um, takes it one step further. There's two different kinds of basic characterizations.
Either you assess the hazards at their source or you ID potential exposures. And the path you take is based on what your true objectives are. So step one and th two, basic characterization and develop your objective. Step three looks at whether you can put people into similar exposure groups or not so that you can evaluate those people at, with a singer ex, single exposure profile. So you identify both representative people and then you can identify high risk people as well and conduct two different types of sampling, your worst case and then your random selection of people who are representative. And there's a much longer um, module on developing similar exposure groups. So for our example, they had similar processes. So the 14 people that worked in this facility both worked in the downdraft booth and with the glove box. All workers were cross-trained to be able to do both jobs, and therefore it was felt that they um, was highly likely that they had very similar exposures. And therefore, the 14 people were able to be um, aggregated into a similar exposure group. They all did both jobs. They all performed the tasks in similar ways. And they both did um, work in the downdraft and the glove box situation. So step four is developing your workplace monitoring plan. And this is... Um, really where I enjoy doing industrial hygiene practices, coming up with a plan of um, what you're going to sample for and how you're going to sample, and then implementing your plan, because it's so um, fulfilling to have the data at the end of all this planning and use it to evaluate um, exposure or not. So you can have a protocol for each hazard as well as a protocol for each method inside a hazard. So for example, asbestos can be evaluated with two or three different methods, and you may need to use them based on your sampling um, protocol. So the data that you need is, um, can you put people in similar exposure groups or not, or do you just put them in exposure um, or hazard categories? And what's the purpose of your monitoring for your similar exposure groups or your hazard categories? That should have been already previously defined. But just kind of keep in mind that we have these short-term effects, long-term effects, and then the combination of our short and long-term effects. And then you document your procedures, or I call this your protocol for measuring the exposures. What methods you're going to use, what media you're going to use, um, how you plan to calibrate, as well as when you actually sample how you calibrated. The number of measurements you'll need, so the number of um, workers that you'll need to sample for, and then the number of samples per worker. Um, so that gets into the type of sampling you're going to do. Where you'll sample. Um, are there certain conditions that need to be present for you to conduct your sampling? For example, like having the workers actually do the task. Um, and then in developing your monitoring plan, you would um, start to research the occupational exposure limits that you are going to compare your results to. Actually, I believe you would do that in your basic characterization, but um, you can look at it more specifically in your workplace monitoring plan. And then what kind of analysis are you going to use to analyze your data? This would all be in your pre-planning, knowing what you're going to do. So in developing a monitoring plan, this um, question comes up a lot. So your procedures for measuring exposures, what method you're going to use, what media type, um, how you're going to calibrate, how you're going to treat those samples once you um, retrieve them or once you actually sample, that's all part of your monitoring plan, as well as um, how many people do you need to sample. So this is the number of um, people that you would need to sample. So if you have um, a population of eight people, based on the NIOSH guidance, you should sample seven of them. If you have a population of 18 to 20 people, you should sample 13 of them. Um, so you can take um, 13 samples, one from each person, or if you took two from each person, then that would be 26 samples, 
or of course three from each person would be 39 samples. So this looks at the number of workers that we need to sample and that's if we're using a random sample to ensure with 90% confidence that at least one individual is from the 10% highest exposure group. So this is a matrix for which that it's a matrix that NIOSH developed and they have it in their sampling strategy manual and it would actually be the number of subjects. So just a reminder what 90% confidence means. It means that there's a 10% probability of missing all of the workers that are within the 10% highest exposure groups if we're doing random sampling. If you're doing worst case scenario, you may be able to find them based on your observational data or previous sampling. So the number n, the number of people that we choose, is um, based on statistical confidence that at least one of them will be within the top 10% of our exposure category. And again, that was from the NIOSH document. So our next concept is um, how are we going to sample? So are we going to run one sample for the full period, for the full 480 minutes continuously? And that would be a single sample. That gives us a single shot in time. This is something that it seems like um, OSHA may do if they run their sample, one sample for 480 minutes, or though they could take multiple samples. So if you sample for a full period, but you have multiple samples, this is called consecutive sampling. So if I sample from 8 to 12 and 12 to 4, I have two consecutive samples. Um, it tells me a little bit more about somebody's exposure pattern throughout a day. And then grab sampling is piecemeal. It's really of no value to evaluate a time-weighted average, but it can be used for other um, exposure assessments. And this is um, the representation from the NIOSH document, which I think really shows you um, the difference between a single sample, full period consecutive samples, which is what we strive for, partial period consecutive samples, or just random grab samples. And which one's going to give us the best pattern would be this full period consecutive samples. So from our generalities to our specific, looking at our Cadmium um, workplace monitoring plan, we redefined our objective. So there's yearly mandatory compliance. We're going to evaluate the effectiveness of all the controls that are in place, which includes those work practices, and then validate the previous results. Um, we are sure that we are using a similar exposure group. We know the purpose of our monitoring. We've chose to do full period, so the full shift, consecutive monitoring, so that would be multiple samples per person. We'll use personal sampling pumps following OSHA method ID125G. The flow rate is two liters per minute, and of course in checking that we make sure that two liters per minute for um, 480 minutes will only give us 480 liters, and that's well within our method to ensure we have, um, we're not over, we're not sampling too much air or not enough air. We'll pre and post calibrate and then always send our samples to an accredited lab for processing and sometimes within a certain period of time. So the number of measurements, we need to sample three workers, two from the first shift and one from the second shift. So these workers were randomly selected but the number of workers per shift wasn't. We wanted to make sure both shifts were represented. So um, 14 workers, that's a minimum of four samples each. Four samples plus two STELs per worker means six samples per worker, or 18 samples in total, and our three blanks gives us 21 samples that we'll be sending to the lab. We're going to sample in the personal breathing zone and in the downdraft booth as well as in the open room. 
So after we've developed our exposure monitoring plan and we have sampled, so we've done all the fun stuff, now we need to characterize our exposure, capture any controls that are put into place to minimize exposure, and then um, develop an exposure estimate. So um, here are some sampling results. You can see they're set up by date, employee number, whether it was first shift or second shift, and um, what the eight hour time weighted average was. So these are in micrograms per meters cubed. The action limit is 2.5 and the PEL is five. So um, if you look down into from 2007 to 2008, um, although we're still above the PEL, which makes sense, that's why we're in um, positive pressure breathing apparatus. The exposure has gone down um, significantly. From 2009 to 2010, except for this one anomaly here, this worker number five, seems to be pulling some high numbers. Our exposure is even getting lower. 2011, it got somewhat lower. And then we had a spike here in 2012, so maybe a change in our work practices. So this is part of our characterization as well, is looking at what the past exposures were as well as what the current exposures are. So there was also some um, wipe samples that were done because um, contamination or material was found outside of the sampling booth and outside of the um, glove box. So we might um, suspect that some contaminant is creeping out. And um, OSHA's recommendation is all surfaces as free as practical. And you can see the concentrations of cadmium here, certainly on the top of the file storage cabinet. Boy, the top of that refrigerator, always a place where a whole bunch of um, debris builds up, that there was some secondary contamination. So not only primary, but secondary. And the engineering controls were evaluated as well. You would do this in ventilation, but the minimum ventilation requirement recommendation was um, significantly greater than the measured ventilation um, flow rate found. And the control effectiveness was only 51% which means that this is definitely a place where the um, client or the employer can maybe make some changes. Um, you know, what isn't being addressed here is how often those filters are um, being changed and that could be as simple as that, that preventative maintenance. So when we have our data, we do some um, calculations. We look at whether it's normally distributed or log normally or, or logarithmic um, distributed and then we would change it to be normally distributed by log transforming it. We're going to get into that later so let's just look at our minimums and our maximums, our ranges, our time weighted average assuming that we sample for as close to 480 minutes as we can and then what percentage of our time weighted average, what percentage of those samples was below or above our occupational exposure limit. So once we have um, our exposure rating or our time weighted averages, we look at what, what, what percent are they of the occupational exposure limit. So let's do an example. I think that would be the easiest way to demonstrate this. Okay, so I've added some data. This seems to be the easiest way to look at that. I have uh, the four workers that I sampled and their time weighted average was eight, nine, two, and five parts per million. And if the occupational exposure limit was five parts per million, 
then worker one was exposed at six, 160 percent of the occupational exposure limit, so they were over 100 percent. Worker two was 180 percent, worker three is 40 percent, and worker four is 60 percent. And then I convert that into an exposure rating, and you can see that um, workers one and two are in an exposure rating four. They should, of course, be in respirators and engineering controls, and Revaluate to make sure that we have the um, appropriate respirator. These ones had um, um, air purifying respirators. Worker two was at, um, uh, or worker three was a hazard rating two. So make sure that they follow all um, standards for action limit documentation. NIOSH actually recommends that exposures that are above an action limit but below a permissible exposure limit that you should sample every two months until you can get that exposure down to being lower than your action limit. Um, this isn't always the case because although their exposure may be at the action limit, we know that um, or we're very confident that their personal protective equipment is protecting them. And then we have worker three who is 60% of the occupational exposure limit. And this put um, this worker in an exposure rating of three. So this is where you take your time weighted averages, you convert them to what percentage of the occupational exposure limit are they, and then you um, give them an exposure rating and this allows you to unbiasedly prioritize where you would put controls into place. So finally based on our um, evaluation we would recommend some controls. So um, the recommendations that were made were to ensure proper work practices were being um, followed specifically for the laundering of the um, overalls and um, separation of the eating area from the blasting area to, and cleaning of that area as well. A large scale glove box as well as using chemical stripping or of course robotics. So although report writing is um, step six, there's a specific module on this, so this is more of an overview where you compile your information. You perform quality control to review your assessment and be sure that you were within your methods and your samples were treated, um, were handled the way they should be to ensure precision and reliability. You provide always an executive summary when you do your briefing, as well as a full report to management and supervisors. And then there's record keeping that needs to go into just about everything that we do in industrial hygiene. And finally, at the end, we um, reevaluate our um, monitoring plan based on our results to see if we need to make alterations to it or continue on um, without making any kinds of alterations. So the goal here in this um, rather long learning unit was to understand the, um, how to develop a sampling strategy but, and um, an exposure model. But truly the goal was to help you understand the importance of the basic characterization, how that helps you define your objectives so that you can develop the correct workplace monitoring plan, which will change over time based on your exposure characterizations. And this is done in that re-evaluation um, loop. And here's the example from the text. It was a lot of material. There's some additional material on Moodle for you to um, review. And I hope you have a splendid day.